Hi again, everybody. This video is sponsored by a contribution from Denise. Here's her story. Hi, Ollie. I'm going to donate to you again after I press send. I sent to you. I sent you this before. Then, as you may recall, I became fearful and asked you not to cover this true story of a few of the many bad things my narc ex-parents did to me. After seeing your two videos of you recapping what happened to you and that other video, how to tell a narcissist you're not afraid of them, I've decided to be brave and send you this video with my permission and request a comment on what these sadistic assholes did to me. This is just a snippet. I am Denise LaFrance. I am a self-taught 52-year-old painter and mother of a wonderful son in Toronto, Canada. My son is the one great person I love more than life itself. He keeps me strong and grateful. Pat and Gil are my former parents, a.k.a. malignant narcissists, or as I like to call them, intentional sadistic assholes, or ISAs for short. Please speak briefly and softly and don't strain your voice. I do not want to cause you pain. Sorry, I swear, and particularly that I use the word cunt. It seemed fitting, and in doing so, it demonstrated how the way I was always singled out and given the worst treatment because I am female, and that this effed up upbringing in the, in the household made me not particularly enjoy being a woman. I like men, but I tend to feel like I'm in drag when I dress femininely. When I do, I like how the public receives me, but I, it, it, it does not feel natural because being a woman in my Narcx family means being abused by dad and mom, who also was abused by dad as well. My three older, older golden child brothers got no abuse. Here's a link to my video if you're interested. Caution, I lose it in the end. Thanks for helping us. I wish you were my brother. Sincerely, Denise, the painter. Well, thank you, Denise. Sorry it took me so long to get to this. Sunday and narc a -matic. Uh, I'm smoking. Don't say anything about it. Yes, I know it's bad. I'm a stressful person. Stress calms me down. And I'm going to talk about something that's somewhat stress-inducing. And you can't smell it. It's not making you cough. It's a cigarette on the screen. So never mind. And my paintings aren't up. You see how I stick notes to the wall. You can't lose a note if it's stuck to the wall. Okay, <laughs> I'm not perfect. And here we go. I talk a lot about my mom, my narc ex-mom. And I write about her frequently. You know, she was the most vocal annoyance picking on me. Uh, what seems the most... Uh, horrible to deal with is that she oscillated. She was like one of those <laughs> lawn sprinklers. She oscillated. Really fucking me. To quite nice, I might say. Yes, she could be nice. She was the only one I talked to on the phone. You know? Uh, Narc dad would answer the phone immediately, pass it to her. That guy called me once in my whole life. And uh, I was like, what's wrong? Like, I thought something was wrong. And it was not that long ago. It's been the past decade. And she was out of town, and he just felt like chatting. It almost threw me off the sofa, the shock. What? He's calling me? Okay. She and I. It's a love-hate thing that was going on. She would lay on the niceness and then turn mean. And it would fuck me up because it, it, it gave false hope. And then pull the rug out under it. I'm back. Which is the intention. It's deliberate. That's why she did it.
the fact that your father never would talk to you like you're not good enough to even speak to. And you mentioned he, he was abusive towards your mother, so he probably called you because it was the first time he'd been without her for any period of time, and you needed to get some supply. Fuck the assholes back. You know? I would never phone her after 6 o'clock, because she'd be slurring. One of those, okay? She had the capacity to be nice really nice and so it feels like a bigger betrayal and it makes me mad at my when was she nice she had the ability to be nice but i guarantee you if you think about every time she was being nice she was either trying to get something out of you or she was only being nice to rip it away and get control over you so it isn't really nice it's a manipulation myself for falling for it each and every time you know, like she's going to be nice this time. Six years ago, I fired her. Okay, I'm in my 50s now. So it's like 40 some years. She had this fucking routine going on and I'm mad at myself for falling for it each and every time. Geez, things are going to be different this time. You know, it's almost meaner to, to offer that false hope of nice. It's never going to, it's never going to be better this time. It's never this better this time. That's the false hope we give ourselves, thinking that maybe they've changed. And you know what? You never really, you don't believe it when you go into it. You're expecting it. And then, voila, here's the asshole. She's back again. You know, I confide stuff in her, and then she'd fucking go and tell what I confided, but then tell me she told because she wants to hear my reaction, okay? It's annoying, the level of betrayal. It's because you think you're like a friend, and then they do it. it. It's almost... Do you know why you keep telling her? That's your subconscious showing you that she can't be trusted. That's your subconscious testing her see what she would do in it. You don't even realize you're doing it. So your subconscious will make you do things like something like that. If she burns you every time you tell her something personal or confidential and blabs it and then runs back, you can't be surprised. So why are you doing it? Because you really want to see if they've changed. It's a test. Recognize when the narcissist fails the test. We're testing them and we don't even realize it. And they're failing time and time again. And we keep giving them retests. They're not going to get it right. They're taking a different test than we're giving them. Worse than having a consistent asshole. Because at least you know they're a consistent asshole. But she would play hot and cold with me. That's why I complain about her a lot. It seems a bigger betrayal. But I want to talk about him. Gil. Man, a few words. Her father, Gil. Tell you about Gil. You ever play that game where uh, it's dark in your room? You might have a sleepover or something when you were a kid. And you flip the light on and... and Someone's there, your little audience, and you, you know, the light's out, and then it's on, you make a face, and then light's out, and then you, you know, you've got a chicken on your head or something, little funny things, and every time you're doing a different thing. Is that a good analogy? I don't know. It's, I guess what I'm getting at is like little flashes of a quick, short clip from a movie, from different times in your life, little memories like that, flash this, flash that, that's what I got when I think about him, him who was, uh, for the most part, that's your subconscious trying to remind you who he is, that's a warning, it's your brain flashing a warning, remember, remember, remember who you're dealing with.
it's an immediate reaction when you think of them. That's your brain telling you, remember what this dude did to you. Get away from him. Quite a charming man. A soft-spoken man. Handsome in his own way. Uh, French-Canadian. And uh, everybody loved him. He was a teacher at Ontario Hydro. And uh, quite a likable guy, I guess. You know, really did smile and gilly. Really did come across. And even to us kids when he was in that nice mood. And he could prolong the niceness for long periods of time where you almost forget. Makes it a little easier to forget that the shit he's done. But um, he's like a heat-seeking missile. He doles it out. It's direct laser pointed at you and boom! Executed to execute. It is like delivered to have the most concise impact. The words, the things he's done. Let me start back to very early memory. Uh, they, uh, they were strange. He was strange. Is it a French Canadian thing? I don't know. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. So I didn't have to say it. French Canadians are douchebags. They are douchebags. We deal with them in the winter time down here. They are the most arrogant, mind game playing people I've ever encountered. It's amazing. They are fucking despised down here. Despised because of their arrogance. And they will, <clears throat> and Charlene really clued me into this working in the art gallery. And she has a few friends who work in service, restaurants, that sort of stuff. Everybody has the same stories about French Canadians. They love to talk a big game. They love to waste your time. They love to make you think they're going to buy something. And they'll spend hours, hours wasting your time and then pull it all out and walk away. And they think it's funny. They think it's funny. They make servers, you know, run around with like chickens without head. They are so demanding. And then they walk out without tipping or leave shitty tips. That's French Canadians. If you look at the history of Quebec and the French, and their demands on Canada to the point where every Canadian flight, you have to make announcements in English and French. Quebec is small. It's because they screamed and they yelled and they carried on, on and on and on and on. And I'm not saying it's every French Canadian, but as a group, as a whole, and personally, I haven't met one down here that didn't completely act like that. So... Yeah, I think him being French-Canadian, probably coming if he came from Quebec, has a lot to do with it. It's another one of those cultural things that they pick up. Kiss me on the and they are the worst fucking drivers. They are the worst fucking drivers. They will just hog up two lanes. They, will block. they are... And you just look at the plate and you see Quebec. That white plate with blue let Quebec is like, of course... Of course. So a lot of it does have to do with him being French Canadian, in my opinion. Always. Up to the last time I saw him. Hello. Kiss on the lips. Okay. I guess from a very early age. Because all my life I had cold sores. Like him. And mom. He had them, mom had them, I had them. The three boys didn't. Husband kisses his wife. Father kisses me. Here's a memory. Hmm. Interesting.
Now, I'm not exactly sure, and this is absolutely possible. Because I remember when Precious was a baby, he had all these colds. He was, we were down the shore, and he had these cold sores broken out on his face. They're all over his face. He only had them the one time that I remember. But there were these huge blisters. And I remember my mother, my godmother, her sister, my middle aunt, and who was a nurse at the time, now she's a practitioner, and my grandmother fighting about herpes. About herpes one, herpes two, everybody has this sort of herpes or that sort of herpes. He wasn't even walking yet, so that would have made me six or seven, maybe eight at the oldest. <clears throat> there were other rumors like that in high school with my parents' activity and all that I had to listen to. Funny, I never confronted them about that, though, or him. I don't know if he even knows or remembers or what the act, exact deal was, but there were these giant blisters all over his mouth and face. And it's a flash. And it's him. In your house in Pembroke, so I was under five years old. Had me in, on his bed. And he's laying on top of me. No, he's not fucking. He's holding me down, laying on top of me with a sewing needle. I'm screaming. Let me do, hold still. And he's pricking it with a fucking sewing needle. You know, I remember that. I remember standing in the living room and that sensation of the whole room moving back and forth and my head bang, bang, smashing me like this. Look, look, look. Against the wall. Huh? Shaking me and smashing my head against the wall. I remember that. I remember him having me on the swivel chair in the living room in the house on his knee. I think I don't remember this half dad if you ever fucking look on the internet. I do. Naked with a snowsuit on, bouncing on his knee, rubbing my cunt. Yeah, I can use the word. With this, that slippery fabric against my, my pussy, yeah. I remember, uh, okay, I'll tell that story later, but I remember I went to a, a dance-a-thon. We moved to Deep River. I was like, I don't know, maybe 14. Went to a dance-a-thon with my friends at the church, okay? At the church. And I danced and danced and danced with David Hunt. David Hunt, and I had a great time fitting in, dancing for hours and hours, falling asleep and dancing. I came home, it might have been around, oh, the ungodly hour of 10 or 11, you know. 
and I walked in the door. We had like a foyer when you walk in. The front door's here, the back door's here. There's steps going upstairs this way, okay? And on this side is the garage door, and the garage is attached. Okay, so get it like this. This is the floor plan, if you were looking aerial view. This is the foyer, front door here, back door here, up the stairs here, and the garage door would be here, okay? I walked in the front door. I guess he was waiting at the door. He grabbed me, put me up against the back door. I mean against the garage door. See my nose? Look at my nose. See how it's crooked? Yeah? Yeah, Dad. Thanks. He punched me in the fucking face and broke my nose. Huh? Yeah. But you know, when I graduated high school, Guess who asked me for a dance? David Hunt. We're dancing and he goes, you know what? I saw it out. And I said, what do you mean you saw it? What, what happened? I haven't talked to you since that dance of mine. He heard a lot of shouting in the, uh, I'm making a video. Yeah, actually, uh, can you not, sorry, I had to pause. My roommate decided to come in and start doing the dishes while I'm making a video. Um, David Hunt asked me to dance at the grade 13 graduation. And we're dancing, and he said, I saw what happened. And I, I'm like, what, what do you mean you've seen what happened? What, when, where? I haven't seen you since that dance at bomb when I was 14. He said, when I walked you home from the dance-a-thon, I heard a lot of shouting and slamming. And I ran around from the front of the, front of the house, the front door, ran around the house. And I was looking through the back door to see what's going on. And I saw your father beating you up. Guess what, David Hunt? To this day, you're the only witness to my abuse. I would love to talk with you if you ever are around and happen upon this. The only witness. I you should try to find him, like on Facebook, social media, and talk to him. Inside the family, to my abuse. Physical abuse. I mean, my son has heard abuse, but this is like seeing me beaten up. Yeah. I'd like to talk to him, to thank him for validating that and being my witness. Another time, not that long after, actually. I was about 15 or 16. This time I made it up the stairs, in the foyer, and then up the stairs. And he had me, that fucker, he had me up against the wall again. Now, by this age, I'd been going out with a lot of boys. I was 15, I was popular, and I was looking for love and attention. And maybe I was rebelling. Maybe I was. Maybe I got in with the wrong crowd. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe I did LSD. Oh, bad girl, Denise. So what? Tripping. So what? Smoking pot. So fucking what? What, what, and what do you expect? Right? He had me up against the wall. banging my head on the wall. Gee, what does that remind me of, huh? So we got me in quite the mood. A mood much like I'm in now, actually, reflecting back, remembering and telling you. And he said, 
Why are you living here? And I looked at him. Because it's free. I knew he was going to hit me. I didn't care. I didn't care. That was the truth. Because it's free. Because you know what? There's no other reason to have been living there with this violence, beating my mother regularly. Her coming to me, showing me the bruises, and saying the only reason I stay with him is because of you. Because of you kids, and because of you. Guess what his response was to that wrong, <coughs> wrong answer? Can you see? I don't know. I took a photo of it. See that scar? Yeah, that's where the pin went in to reattach my thumb that he broke. He broke, he broke my fucking thumb. Yeah. Dad. I'm grateful prick since I basically saved his and mother's life. Another memory. Let's go back. <laughs> the amazing time travel of storytelling. He can go forward in time, he can go back in time, and we'll go back to 1972. I'm eight years old. We're all home. It's a Sunday. And what happens on Sundays? Church. Church happens. And then after church, cleaning, dishes, the CBC radio, him sing on television, drinking, arguing, and beating your wife in front of your kids, you fucking loser. You fucking loser, coward little man, little man, beating your wife in front of your kids, you fucking loser, Gil. Yeah. The mayhem was quite solid that night. Around supper time, oh yes. And the three boys fled up the stairs. And I looked, I was on the stairs and I looked, peeked through and saw him beating the shit out of my mother on the floor, like a dog, kicking her, beating her. And then slam, and out goes Gil for a drive. Yeah, that's what he does. She eggs him on. That's the thing. She'd egg him on. She would not shut up. And because they'd fought so many times, even at eight years old, I learned the pattern of what happens. She pokes and pokes and pokes and bitches and bitches. And guess what? Boom! He snaps. He hits, she shouts, he's silent, she's screaming, there's crashing, and the door slams, and he goes out for a drive, and then she boo-hoes to us. Rinse and repeat. Yeah. Rinse and repeat. And that's how it goes. I'm not stupid. Even at that age, and I knew the pattern, and I knew he was going to hit her. I knew he was going to hit her, and I knew he was going to leave. And I went and comforted Mommy. Ooh, ooh, he's so horrible. Look what he did. Look at the welts. Look at this. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And I'm parentifying my mother at eight years old. And I go upstairs. I'm going to leave him. I'm going to leave him. I'm going to leave him. I go upstairs and I tell Richard, she's going to leave us. We're not going to have a mommy. I was eight, so he's eight years older than me. He was 16 and he said, don't worry, I'll be your daddy. Another pause. My beloved son, 
who loves his mother and is such a good and wonderful person, brought me a nice coffee from McDonald's, which is very nice because I've got the oven going, making dinner like a normal family. Doing my best, having a nice normal family. Doing the opposite. I look at how I was raised, and I do the opposite. A little segue here. Narc Mom said to me, this backwards, backhanded compliment. I don't know how someone like you managed to be a good mother, but you are. And my response to her was, well, of course I'm a good mother. Look how I was raised. And I watched her pop up. And I said, yeah, I just looked at how you raised us. And she's like, and I said, yeah. And I did the opposite. And that's a fact. Anyways, back to the story. Boo hoo! He hit me. Look at the welts. I'm going to leave him. He's gone. I'm going to leave. And I'm upstairs and I tell Richard, like I said, he's eight years my senior, so he was 16. I was eight. I'm not going to have a dad. I'm not going to have a mom. They're gone. And he said, it's okay. I'll take care of you. I'll be your daddy. God bless him. You know. And you know how horrible a 16-year-old boy should have to be like dealing with that. You know? Seriously. At any rate, I go downstairs to check on her. Because <laughs> after all, I'm my mother's mother at this moment. She's sitting on the back of the stairs on the way to go to the basement from the kitchen. There's three stairs. Put your boots there, and then you go down the basement stairs. She's sitting in front of the back door. She's busy. She's focusing. I'm trying to talk to her. But she's looking straight ahead, and she's focusing. She's listening, but she's focusing. And what do you think she's focusing on? What's she busy with? She's holding the rifle that she'd gotten out of the rafters from the basement. She's holding the fucking rifle pointed at the back door, waiting for Gil to come home. Mommy, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm going to blow his fucking head off, she says. This little girl is here. See, what are you doing, Mommy? I'm gonna blow his fucking head off. Well, you know, I said about the patterns, right? Patterns of witnessing abuse. You get to learn, because children learn, don't they? They learn cause and effect. You see? common scene enough. You learn cause and effect. And I learned that when the fighting happens, that whenever visitors would come over for a beer, because that's what visitors did, they came over for a beer, that the narcs would be better. They'd stop fighting and they'd act like everything's fine and everything would go back to normal. The fighting would just stop. I started loving people coming over for a beat. <coughs> so what did I do when I saw Narc Mom with the rifle waiting for Narc 2 to come through the door? Huh? I did something for which I received no thanks for from the whole family who owe me a thanks. I went over to the dining room where there was one of those things that was like a little rectangle thing with a metal lid that snapped closed and you push a button, it opens, 
and you slide the letter, the dial down to whatever letter it is. And it opens and I slid it down to B. And I called Norm and Jean Bear. My parents' friends who often came over for a beer. And I dialed that phone. Hello? Hi, it's Denise. I was wondering if you want to come over for a beer. I said that. I said that. And Jean Bear said, Denise, what's going on? Daddy hit mommy. She was bitch, bitch, bitching. And daddy hit mommy. And daddy went out for a drive. And now mommy's sitting on the stairs. With the rifle. She's going to blow his fucking head off. But you know, they came over and they took that rifle out of her hand. And that fucker who broke my thumb, that ungrateful prick perpetuating the abuse, and you think he didn't beat her when we moved to that new house where he broke my thumb? Yeah, he sure did. It continued, it continued. The brothers went off to school, and I was left alone. And that night, hearing through the bedroom wall what my room was on the other side of their room. Jesus, Gil, ow, stop, ow, ow, no, don't, ow, stop. He's raping her, he's raping her. Why do you think her? And I grew up with that. So, maybe I'm the shame of the family. Maybe I didn't turn out as they pleased. And maybe when she says, your father wanted a daughter, repeatedly throughout my life, maybe I know that what she really meant was what she wasn't saying, which was, I didn't want a daughter. He wanted a daughter. Why did he want a daughter? He had a set of three boys. Oh, a daughter will be nice, like picking an hors d'oeuvre off a tray. I think I want a daughter. Guess what? This daughter doesn't want to be so feminine like you want me to be, Dad. Because I see what happens to women. They get beat. Fuck you, Gil. Fuck you, Pat. And fuck you, Golden Brothers, who don't want to talk about it, because it's all in the, in the past, because no, it's not. No, it's not. There's not a lot that can be said. Other than your question of why you're not um, comfortable wearing female clothes or looking feminine. What example was set for you? Your mother getting beat probably because she was feminine. Every time you went out and did something feminine, wore a dress, had a good time, that's when your father beat you the worst. Broke your nose, broke your thumb. So you have a natural adverse, that uncomfortable feeling you get is not because people, it, and those comp, why those compliments disturb you so much is because they were always accompanied by some horrific beating a nose breaking, a thumb breaking. That's why. That's why you have a problem with being feminine in public.
because anytime you had fun being feminine, he sure made you pay for it. I'm glad you're telling your story. You're not hiding behind that femininity. You're not protecting the narcissist. I've told my own gun story. I mean, I was older. My father, my mother pulled a uh, drunk. He pulled a shotgun on my father, waiting for him, because he's such a fucking pervert that uh, there was this full spread of Kathy Ireland back in the early '90s that he had taped up to the mantle and took a full-length picture of with a Polaroid, and she found and didn't recognize it was Kathy Ireland and showed me the picture. I knew who it was. But I didn't tell her. I just left. So what does that mean, But I'm sorry for all this. Um, understand why you have a problem now with your femininity with looking feminine. It's like Pav it's like a Pavlovian response at this point. Except your response is violence. And that's where all that discomfort comes. And as far as you know, your friend who saw it and acknowledged it you have more than one person who acknowledged your abuse. Obviously, you have that one friend who so saw you get punched in the nose, but you have that family. I don't know where they are right now, if they even remember. But you do have people that witnessed it. If your brothers won't step up to the plate, then you don't need them. You don't. At 16, I'm surprised he didn't try to stop it with your father. He just let it happen. You know, you said he said he would be your father, but actions speak louder than words. Now he's 16. Like you said, that's a lot of responsibility for a 16-year-old to take on. But I would have thought there would have been a better response than words. So... Sorry it took me so long to get to this. Um, I've been having internet problems. I can already see, and I can see the thing flashing again. So hopefully I'm going to be able to upload this timely. Thank you for your contribution, and thank you for exposing your narcissist. Um, thank you to everybody watching. Please leave any uh, opinions or advice in the comments section below. I'm also going to share this video, this full video, to... Uh, my channel playlist so you'll be able to see it there as well and remember <clears throat> if you want your story read on the channel you have a narcissist you want to expose or a topic you'd like me to cover you know what to do with the PayPal and my email links in the description box I'll have the video right back to you this is Ollie Matthews thanks for watching see you all again soon bye